uh, obvious candidate explanations. So one would be that maybe uh, the animals have a different mode of breeding. So insects, as you know, have trachea, so they, they breed quite differently from fish. Um, and the other explanation could be that maybe it's to do with the medium that they're in to take up oxygen. Um, and so my approach would be to combine that and look at aquatic insects and see how they res uh, respond to temperature and oxygen. Um, and, and as we're in the aquatic ecology session, you're probably all aware that um, it's difficult underwater. There's much less oxygen dissolved in water than in air. Uh, and also to actually be able to extract that oxygen, you have to move large quantities of water across your gills or su respiratory surfaces. Um, and water is quite dense, so it takes a lot of energy just to breathe. So actually fish spend on average 10 times more energy just by breathing than, than we have to do. Um, and to, to actually test this concept, you can make some predictions. Uh, a very straightforward one would be that if heat tolerance limits or thermal tolerance is set by oxygen, then if you lower the amount of oxygen in the environment, then uh, tolerance limits should decline. Um, and perhaps a more stronger test, if you increase oxygen levels in the environment, then tolerance levels should go up. Um, and I approach this by looking at, at a stonefly. So this is a large stonefly, the largest I could find, and it's a stenothermic species. Uh, because at this uh, point I started my postdoc and I thought, well, I'd better take the most likely species to show this, because if it doesn't show it, then I can move on to other stuff. Um, I'm still presenting this work now, so you know the outcome already. Um, but what we did is we, we, took, we collected these animals, we took them to the lab in a setting where we could change water temperature and oxygen independently, and we basically looked at um, heat tolerance, which is something like this. So here you can see the stoneflies, you can also see some of the animals doing push-up behavior, and that's typical for respiratory distress, so they move extra water across the gills, which are actually in the armpits. Um, and so it's a typical respiratory stress response. And if you heat up the animals even further, they at some point lose equilibrium and they stop moving and they're in this comatose state. They're not dead, because if you then transfer them into cold, oxygenated waters, they completely recover. Um, I tend to put them in liquid nitrogen to assay if they also went into anaerobic metabolism. Um, and this is the result. So by and large, we see that this hypothesis works, that if you look at uh, these comatose heat tolerance limits and the hypoxia, there's a lower threshold, and CT max is actually increased if you put them under hyperoxia. Um, and you may see that uh, the, the actual values are 30 plus degrees, so it might not be too relevant for most um, environments out there, uh, but at least it's a proof of principle that this could be the way it works. Um, and I was also fortunate enough to work with the uh, University of Birmingham um, and we were able to look at metabolites of these uh, nitrogen frozen animals. Um, and yeah, as you can see, under hypoxia at uh, the thermal limit, they do accumulate all these anaerobic metabolites, suggesting that they actually have to switch to anaerobic metabolism, indicating that oxygen is limiting. And if you keep them at the same temperature but you supply them with a lot more oxygen, this pattern disappears, again suggesting that it really is the oxygen that's driving that. So, for the remainder of the talk, there's actually two questions remaining. One is, how general is this hypothesis or this framework? And also, how relevant is that? And, and to start with the relevance, um, as you note, that, um, the temperatures under which the animals succumbed to heat were quite high. So I teamed up with people from Cardiff University and was lucky enough to work with those uh, on some of the data sets uh, from, from uh, Environmental Agency and Natural Resources Wales. And the interesting thing there is that you actually have coupled measurements, site-specific for both temperature, oxygen conditions, here expressed as uh, biological oxygen demand, uh, and mayfly abundance. Um, and so we analyzed that. Um, before We, we used two species. So before going into the, the details of that, we also looked in the laboratory whether those species showed the same pattern as I showed for, for the stoneflies. And uh, Seretala ignita shows the same pattern again. Quite a strong decline actually in, in uh, critical thermal maxima with hypoxia. And uh, Danica, ephemera Danica, also showed this response. Less uh, heat susceptible overall, but uh, still a response in, in hypoxia. <coughs> 
Um, and I'm going to the data. So there was uh, more than 40,000 samples, more than 2,000 locations. So um, this really prompted me to learn R, uh, and which was a good time investment. Uh, I'm not going to go into the details. If you're interested in that, send me an email and I'll, I'll give you a copy of the paper. Uh, what is important is that we use relative temperature because uh, there's all uh, spatial fluctuation in temperature, temporal fluctuation. So we actually used relative temperature to delineate those streams that were relatively warm or relatively cool to see if that had an effect. Um, and we also used binomial GLMs because most of these samples were actually nested within location, so they're not independent observations. And so if you then plot uh, the proportion of occupied samples within a given site, which is a value between 0 and 1, which is also correlated very well with the mean abundance, uh, you can see that there's a clear relationship with BOD. So uh, increases in BOD actually mean that there's more oxygen being consumed, so there's a poor water quality, uh, low oxygenation. And these are very sensitive animals to low oxygen. Uh, so that's not a real surprise, I suppose. But what's interesting is that this uh, decline with decreasing oxygenation was actually exacerbated or amplified when you uh, consider the streams that were plus two degrees ambient, above ambient. So we had a clear, strong rela inter um, interaction between uh, this relative temperature and the BOD levels. Um, and this was actually at values of a BOD of two, which more or less comes into the range of nine milligrams oxygen per liter, uh, which is actually fairly good water quality. So a BOD value of two is, is considered to be quite good. And even at those um, very modest declines in oxygen, you already see a 30 to 50% reduction in, in occupancy. And what's more is that the average temperature of these animals is actually quite low as well. So. Here we see that in contrast to the experimental situation, we already see these fields in the field, we see these interactive effects at much more lower temperatures and much more benign oxygen conditions. So suggesting that it really is a, a mechanism with ecological relevance. And of course, I'm not claiming that these animals uh, keel over under these conditions, uh, but probably the effects are more on the population uh, side where they uh, can no longer uh, reproduce or uh, grow. Um, and we, we had some follow-up study on that, showing that indeed if you rear animals under warmer temperatures, they don't attain the same body size, and uh, body size is usually associated with fecundity, so it's a clear measure of how fit these animals might be. Um, and we actually only showed this uh, pattern under conditions where oxygen is limiting. So as soon as you give them more and more oxygen, this negative effect of, of temperature on size can actually be reversed at least in this species. So heat seems to be a problem, but especially if oxygen is limiting. So on to the second part, last part as well, the generality. So can we actually predict which species are more likely to be at risk uh, and, and maybe some traits that might go uh, with that? So um, we actually compared across four different orders of insects whether we could find the same pattern. And again, on the x-axis, we have oxygen levels and we see a reduction in CT max in each of those orders with uh, declining oxygen tension. Um, but in each of those groups, we could also look at animals that didn't show this effect. Um, so to explain that a bit more detail, I'll focus on the hemipterans. Uh, and those are the two species I use. So those of you who know them, they are a standing water species which has a bimodal breeding strategy. So they have a physical gill, but they can also take up oxygen from uh, the surface. And it's a plastron breeder. And of course, as you might expect, the plastron breeder showed uh, a strong oxygen limited thermal tolerance. So that's the red line. With increasing oxygen, it increased thermal tolerance. With decreasing, it really decreased a lot. Um, and we could actually de demonstrate that it really is this mode of respiration. Because if we negated the possibility for the, for the surface exchanger to uh, reach the surface, um, basically constraining it to, to rely solely on its physical gill, we could induce oxygen-limited thermal tolerance. So here you can see that effect in the dotted line. Uh, we also supplied the plastron breeder with air, but it didn't behaviorally respond to that, so it's the same result there. And so the, the difficulty animals have of extracting oxygen, whether they rely on aquatic uh, breeding or, or aerial 
gas exchange might actually go a long way in predicting the vulnerability to climate change. And that's mainly because it's really difficult to breathe underwater. Um, so just to sum up the main conclusions, so uh, I hope to have shown that oxygen can also limit thermal tolerance even in insects, tracheates. Uh, there's a strong synergistic effect even on the field conditions of temperature and oxygen, so there is an ecological relevance there, and it probably pertains to fecundity losses or survival, and not so much to survival. Um, and the capacity to, to actually regulate oxygen uptake to increase your uptake of oxygen might dictate your vulnerability to warming given this framework. Thank you for listening and these are all the people that helped me develop some of these ideas and also on uh, various papers dealing with this topic. So uh, in this talk, I didn't really look at body size. There is a body size component to that as well, that larger animals tend to be more susceptible to oxygen limitation, but that's a bit contentious. Yeah. Um, but uh, for, for the, the result with um, the, the, the growing, yeah. it was indeed the case that the isopods, when they had enough oxygen, temperature did not longer reduce the size, okay. as is the case normally. Oh, so the growth period was like 80 days or 90 days. It was uh, a long experiment. Mm -hmm. okay. And we continuously monitored the growth throughout. Okay. I, I can send you the paper if you... I think we'll, yeah. we'll talk about that. Yeah. Okay, I think we have to go on. So take okay. a question for later for the coffee break. Yeah, shall I put on the next one? Oh, I, I think we'll okay. do it for that one. I don't want to <laughs> take you from your job. <laughs> I, there was no pointer? Uh, no. Okay, yeah. So now it's the turn for Fred Windsor. It's your stage. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so today I'm going to be taking a more conceptual look than the previous two, um, two presentations. And, and this is regarding the topic of endocrine disruption in aquatic ecosystems and looking at whether we can upscale our research in order to better address the ecological consequences that it has within these systems. So for those of you who don't know, I'll provide a, a really basic introduction. So endocrine disrupting chemicals are what are responsible for artificially disrupting endocrine function within aquatic organisms in fresh waters and marine waters. Now these generally operate through hormonal pathways and they have sublethal effects at environmentally relevant concentrations. And it's this sublethal aspect of these suite of chemicals uh, that means there's this potential for biotic and abiotic interactions within natural systems to have quite a significant effect in determining the ecological risk associated with these chemicals. And at the moment, the guidelines we use to assess ecological risk within fresh waters and marine waters as well um, utilize relatively simple uh, lab-based uh, style assessments on individuals and populations to try and understand um, or try and relate environmental concentrations of these chemicals within waters to known ecological effects. Um, the only issue with, with some of these tests, and I say some of them, not all of them, um, is that organisms may not be identified as at risk by these conventional assessments, um, and that's for a variety of reasons, and I'll, I'll, I'll describe some of them later. So the objectives of this, of this talk is, is to try and convince you that, that broad-scale research based on a very good, very sound understanding in experimental uh, fields is, is the way to move this, this field of research forward. I'll identify some gaps and limitations in our current understanding um, and also identify advances we've made recently. And also I'll propose a multi-tiered research strategy in order to organize future research and uh, start integrating our understanding of experimental um, assessments with, with what we see in natural systems. 
So <clears throat> a, recent, a recent, relatively recent paper looked at endocrine disruption and, and they tried to understand you know, at what scales we're, we're looking at this problem. And as you can see over this time series, we're, we're, we're in ever increasing our, our breadth of, of publications on endocrine disruption, but actually at broader uh, biological scales such as populations and food webs, our understanding is, is limited by sort of an absence of research. There's a, there's a clear research gap um, and we're still sort of kicking about the, the low sort of low double digits in terms of our, our abundance of research regarding population and food web scale um, effects. So our understanding at that level is relatively limited in comparison to our understanding of individual based effects. And, and as an example of this, a meta-analysis we completed um, looking at studies reporting tissue concentrations um, of a select suite of endocrine disrupting chemicals uh, within freshwater organisms. Um, we used 121 studies and that provided 2013 observations. And just a few sort of initial results, you can see about, you can see the sort of patchy spatial distribution, um, but that's not of primary interest. For, for, for me, the, my, my interest lies within this sort of um, patchy distribution in terms of the biota that we cover with chordates um, being, or, or having the highest abundance of research for arthropods and mollusks. And also the fact that, that for fresh waters, a lot of this research goes on in rivers and not lakes, ponds, or wetlands. So in terms of, of, of the ways we can start to tackle these problems, you've, you've got these, these three very broad uh, scales of research at the micro, meso, and macro level. Um, as I say, a lot of work's been done at the micro level, and consequently, our understanding of endocrine disruption in individuals is very good. And obviously, the replication provided by these studies is brilliant, and it allows us to have very high causality at that scale. But we're limited by the diversity of taxa it incorporates. We generally use several model taxa in order to infer impacts in other, in other organisms. We don't really incorporate that much uh, or that many exogenous factors, um, such as the interactions with temperature and other uh, water chemistry uh, factors that might change in the future. And also, the duration of experiments are relatively, relatively short. So you could ask the question, what can be done? But actually, that's, that's, that's not quite fair on the field of research. More, more to the point is what is being done. Within recent years, there's been a, a significant advance in our knowledge, and we've started to incorporate some more sort of complex ecological, uh, ecological concepts in order to sort of better understand ecological effects within natural systems. So experimental bioassays can miss biotic interactions and, and can miss the effects of these interactions in, in determining the ecological risk within natural systems. And chemicals also pose varying risks based on the extent to which they bioaccumulate and biomagnify within organisms, within freshwater food webs or aquatic food webs even. And also the biotic interactions present, such as competition, predation, pr pretty, pretty standard ecological concepts, um, can influence the observed effects we see. So this is a really nice study um, by Broden et al. And they looked at, they looked at the activity of in, in perch and damselflies in response to exposure to two pharmaceuticals. And they showed that the activity of perch um, post-treatment in, uh, in the exposed treatment significantly increased uh, in comparison to, to an, a null increase in, in damselfly activity. So this asymmetric response uh, led to an increase in the feeding rate of perch and consequently an increase in the consumption of damselfly pre uh, prey, which were shown to bioaccumulate these, these pharmaceuticals as well. So it led to an overall increase in the trophic transfer of chemicals through the food web. So, so you can see from this that, that incorporating these food web scale processes is important and there is still plenty of work to be done in this field. It, it provides a, an, interesting, an interesting area of research. Now in terms of what I'm really interested in in looking uh, at this topic for my PhD is, is this idea of trophic cascades. So a lot of the impacts we see are, uh, are, are identified in fish and other chordates. And the potential for there to be top-down trophic cascades as a result of endocrine disruption within uh, natural systems is, is relatively well appreciated. So you lose your top predator and subsequently you see a, 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 a change in the population dynamics of, of, of lower, um, lower organisms. But not only that, we have also seen these, these bottom-up uh, trophic cascades. In this example on the, on the far right, uh, uh, the addition of a herbicide, Symmetrin, um, 
was shown to cause a decline in this is just one diet um, or one al algal species. It showed oh, finer even. Um, it showed a, a decrease, and subsequently, Daphnia uh, populations crashed, and uh, they became or wiped out in the experiment. So organisms actually might be indirectly at risk from endocrine disrupting chemicals within natural systems, whereby exposure to the chemical may not pose direct threats to their their health, but exposure of other organisms that they're inherently linked to within food webs may, may cause them may cause some form of risk. So as I say, there's strong evidence to suggest both top-down and bottom-up trophic cascades within these systems. So go, I go back to this diagram where you see fathead minnow uh, population decline by 99%, and that had a range of different effects on, on both uh, on subsequent trophic levels. Um, another, another area of interesting research that's been going on recently is looking at the whole life cycle exposures. So that's trying to simulate a more, a more natural uh, exposure duration whereby individuals within natural systems will be exposed for their entire life cycle. And this research has really clearly uh, shown that individual exposures at, at what we perceive to be susceptible life stages have a significantly different effect to when we expose organisms over their entire entire life cycle and subsequently multiple generations may also be be exposed so the exposure of a parental generation can lead to subsequent uh, reproductive effects in the uh, in the offspring's generations and that's been seen over multiple generations prior uh, post exposure sorry so this is a really harsh statement and i almost want to retract it but it says that Several common tests are too simplistic, and it's, it's not that they're too simplistic, it's that we now understand the processes better, and we then need to go back and revise them to better incorporate what we've learned through these recent advances. And this is more, probably more appropriate for the multiple stresses, uh, multiple stresses theme, but we can't just look at endocrine disruption uh, on its own if we're looking in these systems. We need to, need to situate it within the suite of multiple stresses present. So this, this diagram from Burton and Johnston really helped me to, to, to sort of fra frame my point. And you can see that these three stresses are all related to, to endocrine disruption or, or some form of xenobiotic pollution. Thanks. Um, and actually, relative to the, relative to the rest of stre the stresses present there, they, they contribute a significant amount. Um, so they are a major component of stress, uh, of stress sorry, I've put within fresh waters, but also marine waters as well. And a range of emergent impacts are produced uh, when these stresses start to interact. And again, this is something to take into account when you're looking at ecological risk within natural systems. Site-specific uh, conditions will have an effect on the perceived ecological risk of endocrine disrupting chemicals. So a, recent, a relatively recent study by my associate at Exeter University um, showed that when you combine three stresses, so inbreeding, uh, an increase in temperature, and an exposure to, uh, I believe it was, an exposure to, yeah, a pharmaceutical, um, not a pharmaceutical, sorry, a fungicide, clotrimazole, um, you get this uh, amplified effect whereby you get an additive effect of all these three stresses, and that's seen in the, the uh, high-dose inbred population there at 33 degrees. So when you get the interactions of these different uh, stresses, combining with endocrine disruption, you can get a range of emergent effects that might not be uh, appreciated when you just use singular exposures. So we'll go back to, to this, this diagram, looking at the different, different scales at which we can start to tackle the problem. And we know we've got a very good understanding at micro scales. We know from individual basis, individual based experiments that endocrine disruption is a significant a uh, significant risk for eco uh, for biological or for biota within within aquatic systems, and we're now starting to better develop our understanding in these meso and macro scales. But what this what still remains is these barriers between the the scales at which we assess assess endocrine disruption, and this is where we come in with this multi-tiered approach. I, I apologise, it's it's impossible to read, but it zooms in in a minute, so I'll, I'll help explain it a bit better. Um, but this is an overly complex diagram. It could be very much simplified. And essentially what I'm trying to show is when you complete research at these range of scales, we then need to take the advantages and disadvantages and appreciate the limitations of our studies and then start to feed these into uh, population-based assessments, so at the meso and macro scales, 
and you'll then start to increase your applicability and the complexity of processes you encompass. And then feed this again, again to our food web level assessments and you get an even, even higher increase in the applicability of the research, but also you inc incorporate a lot more complexity. And then, oh, that was not what I wanted. Um, and then if we go all the way back, you have this nice circular loop whereby you're continually informing uh, both individual based and food web level uh, assessments in order to, to sort of progress the field. I'll click through. So in conclusion, uh, competitive, predatory and behavioural effects are generally omitted from most current risk assessments. Um, and the disconnect between experimental and natural system research is, is apparent, but it's easily resolved. And the foundations laid by a very strong experimental understanding of endocrine disruption within these systems has laid the foundations for us now to continue on to work within the natural, within the natural system and, and, and provide this circular self-informing multi-tiered research strategy. So these are, th just want to say thanks to these people, these are these partners on my PhD and if you've got any questions, I, I think I have a bit of time or if not, feel free to get in contact with me. Uh, maybe one very <laughs> Yes, yeah, okay. Okay, that's Thanks fine. That. That's the next speaker is Alistair Hadley, talking about acidity fluctuation in river and effect on freshwater. Afternoon. Uh, it, this may look like old hat, but it has a different angle. Um, John Watt did the work on the fish. Uh, Chaz Eames did the uh, macroinvertebrates and uh, we had water chemistry analysis done at the Institute of um, Aquatic Culture at University of Stirling up until 2013 when uh, the Environment Research Institute took over. Uh, right, button. Right, this catchment is in the far north of Scotland so it's well away from current levels of acid deposition. It starts in the south, um, just to the north of the Baden Graham's Triple SI, and it flows through, does the River Strathy, through large areas of peatland, the uh, Caithness and Sutherland Peatlands SAC. The green hatched area is a, a wind farm, which is, this work was funded by, by SSC to demonstrate or just to look at uh, make sure there weren't any impacts on the aquatic side part of the water quality monitoring plan and those red circles show the monitoring sites where water chemistry was monitored uh, including controls and one control outside the strathy in the Hallidale River which is a better fish river uh, has salmon as, as well. These are just example photographs of these sample sites RSM2 is in the lowest stretch uh, reasonable moderate sized river uh, 7 and 12 12 is your sort of typical peatland surrounded catchment bog and wet heath uh, the outdo clash is um, within the forested part which was clear felled part of the uh, work and that's one of the larger watercourses draining the, the wind farm and these structures here are the where we put in uh, continuous monitoring of pH and water levels um, we measured pH both in the field laboratory from dip samples right from the start be, during a baseline period as well as electrical conductivity, alkanility, DOC, suspended solids, turbidity, nitrogen in form of ammonium and nitrate, uh, phosphate, calcium, aluminium and zinc. But I will only be covering acidity as in pH. Uh, the map on the left shows pH. Uh, the pH in the main stem of the River Strathy, going from the lowest reaches at the top there, it's 6.2, um, and the upper reaches here, 5.9. So there's not that much variation in actual pH. The tributaries coming off the peatlands, lower pHs mean values of around 5.1, 5.5. The map on the right shows the minimum pHs that are recorded over that period. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> 
most of the report was fine. Um, much more acidic to a certain extent on some of the tributaries. But in the middle part, at RSM7, it was also low. This is my fish pie chart. Um, with the purple uh, is the salmon par densities. The, the, the diameter of the circle is proportional to the density per 100 square metres. So we're doing multiple runs by electrofishing. Uh, the blue bits are the salmon par. Yellow is trout fry. Green is trout. Uh, sorry, the yellow is ye uh, trout fry and the green is trout par. Good numbers. They're considered these densities to be good or excellent in the main stem of the river, except in this middle reach here, uh, which is actually upstream of the, the wind farm area. So we've we actually found there was no impact on biota from the, the wind farm, as far as we can tell. And certainly on pH, there wasn't any impact from the deforestation and the uh, construction of the wind farm site. But so what I'm trying to show you here is some, what appears to be a natural variation in pH and its impact. That's just the mean densities. This shows you the, the fluctuations in pH from dip samples. They do pick out temp the pH dropping below five and four and a half on quite frequent occasions, which um, anything below five is normally considered potentially lethal to salmon uh, par. Um, the laboratory measurements, not as frequent in the field, they were done weekly during the construction phase. Uh, oh, I better go back. The green one line is the uppermost location well up the catchment. The blue was the control above the, the wind farm development and is immediately downstream of where a number of watercourses drain larger areas of blanket bog. And it's mirrored by the laboratory measurements. These acid events um, have, we could count up the number and they are relatively infrequent, or well, we didn't record any at the highest most, but then there were fewer samples taken because it was part of slightly different sampling regime. But the pH really did, considering the number, was round about 10 or 20 percent of the occasions. What effect did this have on freshwater macroinvertebrates? Well, it appears to have very little effect using the biological monitoring working party scores on the numbers and community composition, there were quantitative assessments of the freshwater macro uh, invertebrates. So uh, these two, there are significant variations between years, so maybe between years might be effective, but as far as they, they did occur at these, uh, before any of the um, development processes. But you can see in RSM5 and RSM6, there's virtually the same score. The acidity index from these macroinvertebrates using particular indices, again, no very significant variation really between years than what could be just counted for sort of background variation. Hang on, we stopped. Oh, there we go. We were a bit concerned with the pH and its effect on the fish, and we had continuous monitors put in in 2014 at three locations. One of the lowest down, which is RSM2, lower reaches, and RSM12 is the uppermost. And you can see that the pH drops very rapidly, and this is due to rainfall events uh, resulting in increased flows. And it bounces back very quickly in RSM12, but the lower reaches, it just takes quite a lot longer to bounce back. And that's because there's a much greater catchment of acid bog around. And there are more, it appears, to be acid events in 2000, the winter of 2014-15. So what effect did this have? Oh, that just shows you the relationship between water depth, either using the, on the right hand of the graph, the stage recorder installed by the um, Scottish Environmental Protection Agency at Stratty Bridge and dip samples, 
or using the continuous flow monitoring data. There's a huge amount of data from in it, the, these continuous monitoring uh, equipment. This is a salmon uh, densities for each year for a number of the lo locations. And there are quite significant interannual variations in the populations. In most cases, you might regard them as fairly well sort of typical population fluctuations. The one on the right there, the far right is the Hallidale. U1, 2 and 3 are uh, uh, the Euras tributary again from the peatland. And these have relatively few salmon within them. Breeding, anyway. Um, but when you look at the par numbers, they crashed in the red ones are 2012 and in 2015. And they only recovered a little bit in 2016. There is no reason why in 2015 there shouldn't be a reasonable number, given that there was quite a lot of par in the, uh, sorry, fry in the previous year. So I had a look at the number of acid events and how that relates. And it's not that strong if you look at the dip samples because in 2014 there was good numbers, uh, this is a lower region, good numbers of par. Uh, um, there have been in the winter of 2013-14 uh, at least six acid vents where the pH went down below five. Unfortunately, because we've only got continuous monitoring data over, an, over the last couple of winters, we haven't got it in those years. But this, the dip samples don't really cover the frequency and intensity of acid events that might occur in naturally in these rivers. But with 2015 and 16, there was very few parts, despite there being moderate, should I say, numbers of fry the previous year. Um, so I'm inclined to say that the data is a bit on the incomplete side, but that's the reality of uh, trying to do this sort of work. Um, but we have got a reasonable series of data between years for the salmon. And it, it's, they seem to be far more sensitive to these interannual variations than trout. The trout are mainly concentrated, as you saw on that earlier pie charts, on the tributaries. There's obviously competitive interaction between trout and salmon. And the, the trout are occupying the smaller watercourses. But there is good numbers in the Dew Clash, and that's experienced significant acid events. It both seems to be affected to a certain extent in 2012, but not in 2015 or 16. So they are less susceptible to these periodic acid, acidic events. So in terms of hydrological conceptual model, trying to understand these systems uh, help, will help interpret to a certain extent the biology in that you have a river that's in summer is largely dependent on, a, to a certain extent on groundwater flows from bedrock and subsoils which have relatively high -ish pH 6.8 to 7.6 moderate calcium concentrations but it's a very low flow and during the summer you've got the water table going down and increased decomposition of organic matter in your peaty soils which when you have a rainfall event get washed in massive load of acidic fulvic and humic acids where there's virtually well there's no alkalinity whatsoever and the flows become dominated by those overland flows of peaty waters now, the other question would be aluminium. We did measure the aluminium concentrations. And um, even during period years when there weren't the um, reductions in number, there were quite high levels of aluminium. We're regularly recording maxima of 100 to 200 parts per billion of dissolved aluminium. 
that's not the same as the amount of monomeric unchelated aluminium which is the toxic form which kills shown in the laboratory at one part per billion the one th question that comes out of this work is that how many of these acid events are required to actually knock off the salmon because virtually all studies have been done in laboratory and we haven't got a really clear idea of how intense or how long an acid event in the field is needed to actually knock off the salmon par during the winters which is when these are mostly occurring they're obviously occurring before the, the eggs of the salmon fry emerge from the gravels and occurring during the during the summer period um, so just in conclusion the pH levels drop very significantly after heavy rain especially in autumn and winter the contribution groundwaters with moderate levels of base cations is quickly swamped by these base deficient waters and these episodic natural events may affect salmon more than trout but not in every year and some water causes certainly more naturally and more acidic than others. And this is dependent largely on the alkalinity of base and the buffering capacity of the waters. And I'd like to just thank the following people, Michelle Morton and Andy Jacobs of SSE, John Watt, Water Side Ecology, and the people at uh, the Environment Research Institute and Institute of Aquaculture, and also the ECOWs who did all the field measurements and sample collection. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Alistair. Um, do we have time maybe for a very short question? No? Thanks. Then it's... <laughs> Next speaker is Kate Mathers, if I'm spelling that right. Uh, thanks everyone. So um, I'm a PhD student. I'm just about to hand in my PhD. And today I'm going to be talking about one element of my work, which has been looking at the interactive influence of fine sediment loading and invasive crayfish on macroinvertebrate communities. So just a quick background on signal crayfish. They're considered to be one of the most prevalent invasive species within Europe. They exhibit our selected characteristics, so they have rapid growth rates and can establish large population densities quite quickly. Where they invade, they often have quite significant effects for the ecosystem due to their polytrophic feeding habits. So they consume anything from macrophytes and um, phytoplankton right through to macroinvertebrates and even fish eggs. So previous work which I've conducted in my PhD has demonstrated that where invasive crayfish invade in lotic ecosystems, they have significant and long-standing effects for the macroinvertebrate communities. And these persisted for over 10 years after the invasion date, so the ecosystems didn't seem to be um, recovering from the invasion. It was predominantly slow-moving taxa which was affected, so leeches and snails, which um, are easy prey items for the crayfish to um, capture. And because of the large-scale uh, community modifications that took place, it had significant implications for many of the commonly employed freshwater biomonitoring indices. So um, those which incorporate abundance-weighted techniques, such as life for flow evaluation and PSI for sediment, um, were significantly affected in terms of their ability to determine the stressor that they were designed for. However, invasive crayfish are also significant geomorphic agents, and they can interact with fine sediment dynamics in a number of ways. The one which is most um, applicable to this study is that in terms of in their native habitat range, they're not known to burrow into the sides of riverbanks. However, where they've invaded in the UK, we're seeing um, large swathes of burrows in the sides of the banks. And some measurements which I took for my PhD in 10 to 12 rivers um, across central England estimated that they're actually um, contributing around a quarter to half a tonne of fine sediment per kilometre per year into the rivers that they've invaded. So it's a signif significant sediment source which we're not yet accounting for in terms of our fine sediment budgets. So when we think about fine sediment loading, it's not just an anthropogenic problem, it's also how biota are interacting with the sediment as well. And so just quickly to run through the background of fine sediment itself, it's typically considered to be particles less than two millimetres, and it also has negative ecological effects for the whole trophic ecosystem. <coughs> 
It typically leads to a homogenization of habitats and communities, with communities typically being dominated by relatively few taxa, mainly those which are not susceptible to saltation effects or sedimentation itself, so they don't have delicate, delicate gill um, apparatus or filter feeders. And it's now considered to be a global issue as well. So the research questions which I aim to um, explore were, are the implications of signal crayfish populations persistent, or do they vary interannually? So typically, most of the research to date looking at invasive biology has typically looked at the net overall effect on the ecosystem, either through um, one-off sampling events or through experimental studies. There's not been a lot of consideration of how the effects may vary interannually associated with the life history traits. Secondly, looking at what are the main taxa affected by these invasions. And then thirdly, looking at whether the effects of fine sediment loading and crayfish presence have independent or additive effects for the macroinvertebrate communities. So the methods which I utilised was at a reach scale. It looked at two rivers in Rutland in the UK. One river was invaded in around 1995 and had a well-established population by the time I sampled it. And the second was a control river which doesn't support any populations of crayfish. And the study focused around the short-term temporal evolution of effects, mainly based around the um, crayfish season, which um, the sampling started on the 21st of May, which was before the crayfish season really began to get active, and then it finished around the 24th of September, which is um, just when it's getting to the end of the crayfish season. Most of the crayfish activity is strongly correlated with water temperatures, so it's mainly active during the summer time period. The methods which were used were um, colonisation cylinders, which are gaining increasing recognition in aquatic ecology studies. And this is essentially where you install an artificial substrate into the riverbed and you leave it in for a set amount of time and then you go back and retrieve it and see what's colonised those substrates. The study utilised quite a high resolution sampling rate of a 14 day replacement. So every two weeks I'd go back and remove the mesh bag which had um, a known amount of gravel inserted into it and would take it back to the laboratory and then the, the invertebrates were processed and identified to species level. The total sam sampling duration in total was 126 days and there were two treatments that were analysed. A clean substrate which had no fines within it and then a sedimented one which had a known quantity of sand um, inserted into the cylinders and preliminary tests indicated that this filled 100% of interstitial volume. So essentially it was clogged and really had a limited habitat availability for the macroinvertebrates. Each of these treatments was replicated 12 times per site per sampling um, time period. Crayfish activity was monitored by two ways. So firstly, the adults were monitored by um, catch per unit efforts. And secondly, the juveniles were recorded in the colonisation cylinders and then um, standardised to individuals per metre squared. Now, um, crayfish are typically difficult to characterise. Most, uh, most studies to date have used trapping. However, these overcharacterise the adult populations because they're not effectual at looking at the juveniles. And so utilising the colonisation cylinders, I was able to get a record of both the adults and the juvenile um, activity levels throughout the summer. So it represented quite a novel way of monitoring the juvenile um, densities. So looking at the adult um, activity over time, during the sampling set one, there wasn't really any activity at all by the crayfish. Set two, we got this um, dramatic increase in the number of crayfish which were captured. And this probably um, correlates with um, egg release of the crayfish populations. So if you look at the um, graph on the right, you can see the spike in the juveniles which are recorded. And this actually peaked at 150.5 individuals per metre squared. So it's a significant amount of juveniles which were recorded. And it just highlights the fact that where crayfish um, do invade in ecosystems, it's unsurprising that they can reach these large densities so quickly. However, the adult um, activity can also be inferred through uh, suspended sediment levels, um, and these were also monitored um, simultaneously at the river site. So when crayfish are active at night, they can often biotivate fine sediment, and this goes into the water column. Um, and when we looked at the records during the sampling set, there wasn't any evidence of the suspended sediment regimes changing, and so we don't think they're actually active, um, particularly in that time period. They may have just released their eggs and then um, gone back into um, their burrows. And then, indeed, in set number three, you can see that it's, it's quite a low activity rate. So set four is really when the crayfish season began to start, and um, this continued through to set number nine. And when we look at the juveniles, these were present from the sampling set number two through to sampling set seven, and then they weren't recorded in the colonisation cylinders 
during uh, set eight or nine. This might be due to the fact that um, signal crayfish are cannibalistic, so they might have eaten their young, or the, the juveniles may have just grown so big they couldn't access the substrates during these time periods. So when we look at um, the crayfish invasion effects over time, these are um, NMDS temporal trajectories. So each of the sampling points represents one of the um, nine sampling sets. When we look at um, the sampling sets one to three, which is when um, the crayfish weren't really active, you can see that in both the control and the invaded communities, we get these stepwise changes in the communities, which um, are associated with the life history train, just, just the um, life history histories of the macroinvertebrates, so they're just changing naturally over time. When we look at sampling set three, we get a difference in how the communities uh, react. So again, in the control um, site, we get this stepwise change in the communities, whereas in the invaded site, we've got this um, jump over to the right-hand side of the ordination plot. So the, the crayfish have had a significant impact on that community, which is different to the control site. When we look at sets four to eight, which is when the main crayfish activity is, again, the control site changes gradually over time, just associated with the macroinvertebrate life cycles. However, in the invaded site, it looks like it's been homogenized quite a lot, and there isn't really much change in the communities once the crayfish have really got active. And then during set eight and nine, we again get this stepwise change. Um, in the invaded site, this sampling period also coincided with the reproduction period of crayfish. So again, that change in their life history stage has, uh, looks like it's had an impact on the macroinvertebrate communities. So even though the crayfish populations in this river are well established, they've been there for 20 years now, we can detect these subtle changes in the macroinvertebrate communities over time associated with the different life history stages of the crayfish. So then if we look at whether the effects were consistent over time for the community, these are just two of the sampling sets um, that are presented, so set four and set eight. However, the patterns were similar for all nine of the sampling sets. So you can see that um, the invaded sites and the control sites have totally different communities from each other, and these were um, determined to be significant via analysis of similarity in all instances. Now, these two rivers were included in the long-term analysis, which I mentioned at the beginning of the um, talk, and prior to crayfish invasion, so prior to 1995, they had similar community composition and they plotted um, on the same part of the uh, ordination space. However, following invasion in 1995, they, they, they then began to diverge and plot separately. And it looks, that, um, looks like they're still plotting consistently apart from each other. So crayfish have had a significant effect on the community composition that is lasting for 20 years now. And this is just highlighted here in the global data set. So these are all the sampling points plotted together. So they're completely different communities. When we look at taxa richness over time, taxa richness was significantly lower in the control sites in most of the sampling sets. And uh, beta diversity was also significantly lower at the invaded site. Interestingly, beta diversity showed the most marked divergence during sampling set four, which is again when the crayfish activity really began to commence. And when we consider what taxa were affected by the crayfish, in the literature, it's mainly uh, leeches and snails, which are um, cited. So Erpopdella oculata, which is a leech species found in the, these two rivers, um, were pretty much locally extinct at the invaded site. There was only eight individuals found, whereas there was around 250 found at the control sites. So Erpopdella is a slow-moving taxa. It's easy for the crayfish to predate on. Uh, Potamopyrix and Tibidarum, which is a snail species, this showed uh, inconsistent effects to crayfish um, predation and actually was found in greater abundances at the invaded site. So this just highlights the fact that we shouldn't really be generalizing taxa as a whole. Most people cite gastropods as being strongly affected by crayfish. However, we need to look at the individual characteristics of the taxa. And this is an invasive mud snail. It might be able to evade it by going into silt deposits, or it may just be trophically inefficient for the uh, crayfish to consume. Looking at another slow moving taxa, Dicronota adiptera, this was found in higher abundances at the invaded site during sampling sets one to three, but then it dropped off during sampling set four, which is when crayfish began to become active. Now, this just highlights the fact that um, we need to consider when we're sampling in order to detect a stressor. If we'd have sampled only during sets one to three, we may have underestimated the effect that crayfish is having on this taxa. So we need to incorporate um, sampling time periods in association with life histories in order to really gain a, a fully weighted um, 
in order to fully understand what effect the stressor has for the whole ecosystem. Looking at Elmidae, um, which is a riffle beetle and they're quite mobile, you wouldn't expect them to be affected by crayfish. However, they were found in greater abundances at the control site, and this taxa is semi voltine so it takes longer than a year to complete its life cycle, so this might be making it more susceptible to predation. And then finally, looking at the order of Ephemeroptera, this is often looked at as an entire order. Um, so Betis, which is a swimmer, it's highly mobile, it's able to evade predation. This wasn't affected by crayfish. However, Haraflebia fusca, which is a sprawler, is more slow moving. And it, um, in, during sampling sets one to three, it was recorded in higher abundances at the control site. And again, this just highlights the need to consider when we are sampling in order to detect what effect a stressor has. Um, so during sampling sets four to nine, it wasn't really recorded, and this was after its flight period. And finally, considering sediment and crayfish as a whole, um, when we considered um, clean substrates and clogged substrates, the clean substrates had the greater divergence when we're considering the, the effect that crayfish has. Um, so they're species rich, um, they're more likely to have a more marked effect when the crayfish um, predates on the taxa. However, you can see that the sediment and crayfish did have independent effects, so they plot as four distinct communities in the ordination space. And this is probably because the crayfish have been there for 20 years, the community effects are already well established, and so we can't determine whether it's an additive or independent effect. This might be a different case in terms of um, experimental studies. I just quickly, um, so invasive crayfish have consistent effects regardless of substrate. However, we can detect key life cycle um, stages in the um, macroinvertebrate communities. The stresses of sediment and crayfish had independent effects, and they both represent significant threats to ecosystem functioning. I'd just like to thank my um, studentship and co-funding from the Environment Agency. Thank you very much for listening. Speaker is George Bunting. <coughs> Put this up for you. Start with Twitter. So, it's not just yours. Uh, so, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just starting the third year of my PhD, and I'm focusing on some of the effects of fine sediment on their own vertebrates. And I'm just going to talk to you about the first experiment that I've done for my PhD, which is actually looking at the effect of a fine sediment pulse on invertebrate surface longitudinal and vertical distributions in stream mesocosms. So first of all, I'll just give you a bit of background uh, about the effects of fine sediment, and then I'll talk you through my experiment and just talk you through some of the key hypotheses that I'm looking to test. So firstly, what do we mean by fine sediment? As Kate's already discussed, um, there's a number of, of um, definitions within the literature, but the most widely accepted is that fine sediment is any sedimentary particle less than two millimeters in size. So by far the biggest contributor to the fine sediment entering watercourses in the UK is from agriculture. Next largest would be from eroding channel banks. Um, then next would be diffuse urban sources. So this is runoff from roads and that sort of thing. And then the smallest contributor, but still significant, would be point source discharges. So this should be storm outflow drains and sewage treatment work outflows and that sort of thing. So why is it a problem? Well, fine sediment is a perfectly natural part of the freshwater ecosystem. But unfortunately, in the last century, fine sediment yields have almost doubled. Um, now, this is mainly due to agricultural intensification. But also, in the future, climate change is expected to raise the levels of fine sediment entering rivers. Um, now, this is caused by increased rainfall intensity and is also expected to be more low flow events, which will increase the amount of sediment being deposited into watercourses. Um, so what are the effects of fine sediment on freshwater invertebrates? Now, Kate's already covered some of these. But if you imagine, uh, a lot of the invertebrate species have very delicate um, organs. So any particle saltating along the bottom of the watercourse can abrade these delicate um, organisms and damage them. Um, it can cause catastrophic drift. So drift is the process whereby invertebrates get picked up from the riverbed carried along within the water column and deposited at the location downstream. Now this can either be a voluntary process, part of some species normal behaviour, or it can be an involuntary process. So if you imagine saltating particles along the bottom of the stream bed can actually dislodge the organism, carry it down the water column and deposit it at a different location. Um, burial is also a problem um, associated with fine sediments. 
This is especially a problem for less motile taxa, such as snails and that sort of thing, which haven't actually got the capacity to extricate themselves if there's a lot of fine sediment being deposited, whereas more motile species can actually get out of the way and find some more suitable habitat. Um, fine sediment deposition also changes the substrate composition. You see on the picture at the back here, in this nice cobbly um, stream bed, you actually find a lot of interstitial space. But if you imagine a lot of fine sediment gets deposited onto this um, stream bed and it fills up all of this interstitial space. Um, so it can make what was once quite a suitable habitat for many species to change. So it makes it a lot less suitable then for those same species. Um, and it also causes stream bed clogging. So this is again where the fine sediment particles are actually blocking up all the interstitial spaces and it prevents the use then of the hyperreic zone so the level below the surface water and between the surface water and the groundwater is the hyperreic zone. So it can actually present, uh, prevent access to this zone for invertebrates and also prevents the flow of water and nutrients into the hyperreic zone. Um, and there's also chemical effects. Now these are very much dependent on the constitution of what the sediment's made of. Um, so if you have sediment that's very high in organic matter, this can cause depletions of dissolved oxygen. But also studies have been done on the sediment containing a lot of mine waste and toxic chemicals. And now these can actually build up within the ecosystem and cause quite a lot of negative effects for many invertebrate species. Um, and as well as these, there's indirect effects. As I talked about, it can change the habitat, but it also affects macrophytes and other um, species that you would find within freshwater environments. Now, um, as many invertebrate species use macrophytes as food sources or as their habitat, any effects that the fine sediment has on those will then have knock-on effects on the invertebrate species. Um, so this is just a diagram showing you some of the interacting effects that fine sediment has, just to show you that it's not a simple problem really that I'm looking at. Um, now, two of the things that I'm particularly looking at uh, as part of my experiment, the effect of fine sediment on invertebrate drift, um, and also the effect of fine sediment on the use of the hyperreic zone by invertebrates. So invertebrate drift, as I've explained, is just a process whereby invertebrates enter the water column, drift further downstream, and then deposit out at a different location. So it's been found in previous studies that fine sediment deposition can almost double the percentage of the benthos that you find in the drift, and that even very small increases in sediment load can cause very significant um, increases in invertebrate drift. And I also need to say at this point that the drift response varies greatly between taxa. Um, then I'm also interested in the use of the hyperreic zone and how this is affected by um, increased fine sediment concentrations. Um, now, th this is a bit of a contentious issue, but the hyperreic zone has been shown in some of the experiments to be quite a good refuge from different environmental stresses, though this hasn't been conclusively proven at the moment. Um, but the ability of the hyperreic zone to actually function as a refuge um, depends on a few physical habitat pr uh, parameters, particularly the sediment porosity and the hydrologic exchange. But as you can imagine, as I explained earlier, if the riverbed is getting clogged, then it can actually cause um, the a limitation of porosity, and it also limits the pore water flow into the hyperreic zone. Um, so to try and investigate some of these things, my experiment is using 12 open air um, flow through stream mesocosms. We're actually located at the Freshwater Biological Association's River Lab down in Dorset. Um, and as part of my experiment, I wanted to see the effect of different substrate types on the response of, fine, of invertebrates to fine sediment. So does the response differ between a very coarse substrate and, or between a very fine substrate? It's so a very coarse substrate, you have a lot greater interstitial space. So you may imagine that invertebrates can then use the hyperreic zone to escape from the fine sediment being deposited on the surface of the riverbed. So half of my channels consisted of a very fine sediment mix, a very fine substrate mix, sorry, and the other half can, um, consisted of a very coarse substrate mix. Um, and as my channels were actually connected to a natural river, I could leave them for 60 days and then they could be colonized by invertebrates actually coming through from the main river. Um, and then I used three, uh, sorry, two different uh, treatments. So moderate amount of fine sediment, high amount of fine sediment, and then the control. 
Uh, all of the sediment for the, my treatments were sourced from areas um, adjacent to the uh, mesocosm channels. Uh, and just to make sure I wasn't actually introducing any extra invertebrates to the channels, everything was frozen for 48 hours prior to use. Um, and then when it came to adding the sediment, um, it was added in solution at the head of each channel for three minutes. Now these pictures should help explain a little bit more what I was talking about. These, the top left is just the channels before I, I was using them, so they hadn't been used for a few years and were very overgrown. Um, and then you can see here, once I've cleared them out, these tubes that you can see here, they're for sampling the hyperic environment. So they're at 5, 11, and 18 centimetre depths. There's holes drilled in the bottom of these tubes. So I can suck up water from those corresponding depths. And I know that any invertebrates that I have in those samples come from those corresponding depths. Um, and I also use those tubes to sample the hyperic environment, uh, the water quality in the hyperic environment. And then you can see on the far picture the drift nets that I use to sample the drift. So basically what I'm interested in, in my experience, if you have a fine sediment pulse entering the mesocosm, what do the invertebrates do? Do they drift off further downstream or do they actually go uh, migrate vertically downwards into the stream bed? And again, once the fine sediment is deposited, do the invertebrates drift downstream or do they actually migrate vertically down into the riverbed? Um, and as I explained earlier, I'm very interested to see the effect of substrate type on um, this response. So as you can see, the coarse substrate, you'll expect to have a lot greater inter interstitial space. So it should be a lot more usable as a habitat by the invertebrate species. Whereas the fine substrate will actually, you will find a lot less interstitial space. So it might prevent the use um, of the hyperic zone as a refuge. But I'm also interested to see, will this effect still carry on in the, uh, high, under the high sediment conditions? Or will this um, difference actually be negated because the coarse substrate will just be, have all its interstitial volume filled up? So I won't actually see a difference. Um, so to try and answer some of these questions, um, I sampled on the day prior to the fine sediment pulse, I took samples during the fine sediment pulse um, then again, directly after the fine sediment pulse, and just to see the lasting effects of the fine sediment, I sampled 30 days afterwards and 60 days afterwards. So on each sampling uh, occasion, I was sampling the invertebrate drift, or uh, the benthic invertebrate community composition, the hyperic invertebrate community composition, the water quality and the fine sediment concentration, and also the depth of oxygen penetration. Um, I was hoping to be able to present some results today, but um, I'm still working my way through these 2,200 samples that I collected. So I'm just going to have to talk you through the hypotheses that I'm hoping to test. Um, I'm ex expecting that the diversity and abundance of the invertebrate community will generally decrease um, with increasing fine sediment levels. Um, I'm expecting that the drift abundance and the hyperic invertebrate abundance will actually increase with increasing fine sediment levels. Um, whereas the benthic uh, invertebrate abundance will decrease. Um, and then looking at the effects of the different substrate types, um, I'm expecting as a response to the increasing fine sediment um, concentrations that drift will increase in the fine substrate mix more than the coarse substrate mix. Um, that's because they won't have access to the hyperic zone um, in the fine substrate mix. So I'm expecting that there'll be an increase in the drift response. Um, and also the invertebrate abundance in the hyperic zone will increase more in the coarse substrate mix than in the fine substrate mix. So hopefully I can come back next year and try and tell you what I've actually found. <laughs> um, and here's just a few people that I'd like to thank uh, for helping me out with the experiment. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>
thank you for staying to the end. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, caddis flies and gravel in secondary production. Um, so um, my aims, um, this is one of my thesis chapters, I'm going to be presenting results from this. Um, so my aims for this talk is to show you how I measured secondary production um, for one, one caddisfly species, Agapetus fuscopes, um, a gravel caddisfly species, um, to ha allocate how much of this production um, is actually from methane-derived carbon and to assess which caddis populations uh, take up the most methane-derived carbon per metre squared, so which populations are using it the most, basically. Um, so, um, the caddis fly I'm actually going to be talking about is in panel A at the top there. Um, I did study two other species, um, both silo species, uh, silo nigricornis and silo palapes, but I'm not presenting those results today because there's just too many results. Um, basically, um, they often coexist. All three of these species can coexist together um, in stream gravel. They have quite strong cases, and as you can see with the silo species, they often have these ballast stones, very characteristic um, and very noticeable, and that's to protect against uh, drift in stream. Um, these species often reach very, very high densities in stream, and they're very, very ch charismatic. Um, so the caddisflies I'm actually studying, um, look, um, they actually eat um, biofilm and um, some terrestrial detritus, um, and food webs are generally thought to be based on a mixture of autochthonous, which is photosynthetic resources which grow in stream, um, such as biofilm, and you can see um, aquatic macrophytes in the picture in the blue box there, um, or um, terrestrial detritus, which gets into streams, that's in the red box. Um, but researchers now are st starting to look at this um, methane-derived carbon, which is another carbon source that we now think is entering stream food webs um, in quite high amounts as well. Um, so, what I'm looking at is basically whether caddis larvae are taking up this carbon derived from methane and how much secondary production um, is, you know, they're, they're gaining from that as well. Um, so, how do we measure um, how much uh, methane derived carbon actually um, enters, you know, stream food webs? Um, one of the tools we do have are stable isotopes. Now, I know some of you in the audience probably aren't familiar with stable isotopes. I know there's a few terrestrial ecologists in the audience. Um, stable isotopes are basically a really great tool um, to uh, measure um, resources and how um, whether um, animals are taking up um, certain nutrients and certain resources. So, for example, with carbon, um, you can measure resource and uh, you can measure the ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-13. And generally, what you're expecting with carbon is there is stepwise enrichment. So there's a ba basal resource, a consumer eats that, and it's actually slightly enriched in carbon-13 as it goes up the food web. So there's this kind of stepwise enrichment. So you're expecting something to be on this graph, on the, the uh, carbon axis there, you're expecting it to be the, to the right of, of where, where the resource started off. Um, so this is a very busy slide. Um, but basically, um, if you look at the diagram on the right-hand side, um, there's quite a small axis on the left there, that's stream. And every line across, vertical line across, represents a stream. Um, and so this is a, an example of one of my data sets, is that I had 59 streams, um, and measured resources at these streams, primary resources, and caddisfly larvae. And the big thing to take away from this diagram is the red dots are Agapetus fuscopes, the caddis larvae, and the blue dots are the biofilm. So they're supposed to be eating the biofilm, and under stable isotope ecology, they should be, those red dots should be to the right of the blue dots. Instead, um, the red dots are massively to the left, but they've actually all been ranked by the difference between the red and the blue dots as well, so if you're wondering. Um, so this is showing that, you know, they can't be eating the biofilm, or they're certainly, they're doing something very strange. So that's, that's very interesting. Um, so we think that could be methane-derived carbon, typically because methane-derived carbon, the actual um, biogenic methane that's present in streams and rivers, has a much lower stable isotope signature than the algae and the biofilm. Um, so how do we start to quantify how much methane-derived carbon is actually being, being taken up by these caddisflies? Um, you can use several measures to actually do this. So I measured secondary production. Um, so it's secondary production is the sum of all biomass produced by heterotrophs, and it can be lost by the measures up there. So predation, disease, parasitism, or cannibalism. Um, 
And to actually measure the percentage contribution um, of a resource to a, a consumer, you can use stable isotope mixing models. Now, within my research, I actually use a very simple mixing model, just a two-source carbon mixing model. Um, so I've combined these methods, hopefully it will be understandable as I go on, um, to work out the percentage contribution of the resource and then to actually convert that to grams of carbon in secondary production. Um, so how did I choose the eight stream sites I actually sampled? Well, this was actually based on a preliminary survey of 29 streams I actually undertook in um, summer 2011 and there was some data from streams in 2010. And um, here on this diagram, the catalysis are actually ranked by carbon. Um, so the most depleted catalysis larvae are at the, uh, the left end and the, the least depleted are at the right end. Um, so what I tried to do was pick out streams where larvae weren't very depleted, they, they, you know, they were in line with their resources or just slightly under their resources, uh, and um, very, we tried to pick some sites which were, had very depleted caddis larvae. Um, so to get a balance to see, you know, is there variable, variable um, methane influence there? Um, and as you can see, um, <laughs> there's one site with a little um, star, which I had to cancel as a sampling site because it was always in spate whenever I tried to sample it. And one site was actually added because it was very interesting, had very, very high numbers of caddis larvae, we, which weren't, had, we hadn't observed anywhere else. Um, so we thought we'd sample that just to see if there was, what was going on there. And these are my eight stream sites and the, the sort of distribution across the country of the different sites. And um, previously we did look at geology as well, but geology, you know, they're, they're all depleted on most of the geology types. So that became less important as time went on to, to actually look at. But we tried to pick um, variable sites and you can all see the most sites, um, the actual depth didn't go above uh, 50 centimetres. Um, so, when did I do my sampling? I sampled between November 2011 and October 2012, um, and I used a server sample to actually uh, quantitatively um, sample a patch of gravel to get the density per area of that gravel. Uh, you can see me in the stream there having a great time, and this is actually the stream where we have a lot of caddis larvae, and I'm quite excited to be there. <laughs> um, and th that's the freezer as well that we used to store the samples in. So for the size frequency method, it actually relies on you sort of uh, putting animals into size classes and um, having measurements of their mass so you can start to build up a picture of uh, their mass and their weight. Uh, so quite a lot of caddis larvae were picked out of server samples. It was a very laborious task, as you can see demonstrated by this white, white tray. I spent many hours of my life just picking it with tweezers and a white tray, just sat at a lab bench, um, but it was all worth it in the end, hopefully. Um, so um, agapetus are very different from other classifiers in that they seem to have seven size classes instead of the normal five that we, we usually associate with caddis larvae. Um, so it was very important to actually measure them accurately and make sure they were taking down the measurements correctly. Um, this is just an example of the actual two-source mixing model I was talking about earlier. Um, fractionation was also included. So fractionation is when a resource, there's some kind of, there's fractionation between resource and, and, and the caddis larvae. So th there's all, fractionation always happens. You need to account for that. So try to account for that by using 0.4 per mil. Um, we also included fractionation because we think the way that this methane-derived carbon is actually getting into the caddisfly is through the eating the methane-oxidizing bacteria. That's probably the most likely way that that is happening. Um, so we actually used, we couldn't measure methane-oxidizing bacteria or the, the, um, the isotope ratio of those, so we used a proxy value of minus 45 per mil, um, and that will be their starting point. Um, and then we, we incorporated fractionation of 16, minus 16 per mil to say, you know, include the fractionation. Um, and we, we calculated the proportions of methane oxidized bacteria and biofilm consumed by the caddis larvae for each of the six time points that I sampled. Um, so, um, what did we find? Well, basically, this, this is just uh, annual secondary production. Um, and the graph on the left is annual, annual production grams per meter squared per year. As you can see, this stream that I showed you the picture of me stood in it, um, the cray had very, very high levels of annual production, which we've not seen in the literature previously. Um, 
The, the other graph on the right there is annual carbon production. So that basically, Caddis larvae are about 48% of Caddis larvae is actually carbon. So we're able to cal calculate the carbon content there. Um, and as you can see, it's about half of the annual production. Um, so how, how does this compare to other studies? Well, as you can see, um, there was one study, one or two studies with trivoltine and multivoltine populations where they had just above four or around four uh, grams per metre square per year for annual production. So obviously some of my sites are with that or slightly above that. So that's really interesting because some of these streams are actually tropical streams and obviously I'm working in a very temperate system. Um, how did the Caddis larvae do over time in terms of stable isotope value? Well, um, in s do you see the top panel there, the top left square or rectangle? Um, Caddis larvae are in line with their resource, so they're probably not taking up methane in that stream. But for most of the other streams, you can actually see that the, um, the larvae are, in terms of carbon, which is misleadingly up the left axis, um, they're actually far below the biofilm measure of that site as well. So. Could, there's a lot of um, influence there on methane derived carbon. Um, so, um, in terms of methane oxidizing or the theoretical contribution of methane oxidizing bacteria to caddis larval diet, um, you can see um, there's two scenarios for each stream, and again, that relates back to the fact we've included fractionation, and we've had two levels. We had extreme fractionation, no fractionation. So, for each stream, there's two scenarios, and, and that's actually a range. Um, so you can see for some streams, um, the yellow is actually what is hypothesized to be the methane oxidizing bacteria. You can see that theoretically it is having, um, you know, there, it's a huge proportion of their diets in some of these streams and obviously not so, so much for some of the others. Um, almost up to 50% in some seasons or in some months even. Um, um, the other graph on the right there is the annual mean dietary contribution. Again, that incorporates the two different coloured bars, incorporate the different fractionation scenarios. Um, in terms of annual methane-derived carbon production, as you can see, um, some sites under some scenarios, again, there's a minimum and maximum scenario based on the fractionation. You can see in the Cray, for example, it, it's, it's about 1.4 grams, or it could be at 0.6. So these ranges in, incorporate, there is quite a range based on, on these fractionation scenarios. So there's, there's quite a lot of work to be done to narrow that range. Um, so <laughs> I have um, a Christmas live you all. Um, how many caddis larvae do you think are in the yellow patch, which is highlighted? We've seen quite a lot of lovely uh, gravel and sediment photos today. Um, so just want you to keep that number in your heads. Um, and here I've actually highlighted all of, all of the caddis li larval cases um, for you. Um, and actually the little blue dot is a gamma -ray. So in this, in this, this is actually the cray stream that I was talking about, um, where the larvae are really numerous. What we'd find often with the uh, server samples, we'd, we'd find lots of headless caddis. And I actually observed gamma going in and chopping their heads off and eating the heads and leaving the rest of the body. So um, that's it from me. Any questions? Um, we think most of it's biogenic methane, it's actually coming into streams and it's coming up through the groundwater in some sites. Like the southern sites you saw, some of the short streams, we know that methane is coming up through, through the groundwater and reaching, reaching the river that way. Um, and obviously some of my Welsh streams, it might have been acidic of methane as well that's just reaching the stream. Yeah, that's fine. I, we sort of did preliminary look at other kind of taxa, and um, we found it was just these, these three species. Um, sometimes vapors would be depleted as well, um, and some of the mayflies. Um, yeah, it, it can be quite sporadic of what is depleted in what, what stream. Um, but these, these kind of slides are consistently depleted, whereas other invertebrates are not consistently depleted in the stream. Okay, so 
thank you to all the speakers, thank you for the audience, and um, yeah, enjoy your coffee break and enjoy the closing um, plenary lecture from you. Thank you.